Outrocast. Hey, Stephanie, can you hear me okay? Yes. Cool. How's your day going out there? Pretty good. How's yours? Good. Thank you very much. Not in Bentonville, I take it? Not in Bentonville, but will be in Bentonville tomorrow evening. There you go. Are you calling LA home full time these days? Because it seems like you have to go between there, Missouri, New York for meetings, etc. Um, yes, LA is home and it used to be more moving around pre, I don't know if you heard, but we kind of had an interesting last couple of years. Um, so I stayed, but LA is, LA is basically home. Although Missouri roots in a decade in New York, New York, New York home by heart. What about you? Uh, originally from New York, mostly life in New York for better and for worse. The winter comes and then you go time to get out of here. The LA people know what they're doing, but then summer comes and you go better off here. So Uh, that's the whole thing. Bicoastal is the dream. Sure. So I definitely dig this project and we were connected because of the Bentonville film festival, but it's only one of like 20 projects that you've got going on. And huh. something that struck me, when you get screeners and all that, usually you see a bunch of numbers, uh, numbers in the titles and all that. Did I read it correctly that this was finished in 2019? Yes, it was finished right before, right before the pandemic, I suppose. Um, and then we kind of been, so when we actually got a version of it and we're ready to, you know, kind of send it out to the world and try to sell it, uh, the world shut down. So Bentonville, we're kind of using as our re-coming out story. And I'm um, going to try to see if we can make some more. Did you know outright that this was going to be a TV kind of format as opposed to a movie? Because it definitely has legs that this character, there could be two hours of her and all the great things that she's done as opposed to, you know, just 30 minutes in, a, in one episode. Well, I'm hoping there could be multiple seasons of her, not just two hours. But um, and, and it is kind of a pilot that actually reads like th- I think it actually could be kind of a movie structure. So I really wanted to, so that's not off the table, but in theory, I really wanted to explore her character and her journey, but uh, but all of the characters and kind of all of the different coming of ages that they have when faced with this, you know, weird look at their own mortality and explore things like not everyone being who they are and religion and spirituality. And I think even though we did it pre-pandemic, I feel like this year, a lot of people face death and a lot of people were faced to like realize life is short and like, what do we want to do now? And, you know, what choices do we want to make career wise? And also like, what do we really believe in, in the big picture? So my hope is that we get to explore it for lots of seasons, but there, there's definitely a movie version in there that I wouldn't put past me. Was the whole thing filmed in Missouri? No, we actually subbed Missouri for Encino and Topanga. <laughs> so, so that was kind of a, a, a little bit of a twist. Um, I like the idea of it being set in Missouri. Not only is that where I'm from, which is also why I'm um, one of my sets of grandparents actually came from the Ozarks, which is why I'm kind of excited to go to Bentonville and bring this there. But I also feel that um, you know, the premise of the movie, the idea of getting naked at a nudist Buddhist monastery. In the opening scene. Yeah. (laughs) Well, while that's interest, while that's still shocking in California, it's much more shocking in the Midwest, I think, where things are a little more buttoned up. Um, So, so to me, um, I'd really like to set the, set it, set the series there. I was curious, especially about the Missouri part, because we see looking in the background, kosher deli is one of the signs there. So I was going to go, oh, where's there a good kosher deli in that part of Missouri? I mean, but- you'd, you'd be surprised. There's a little, so that actually, so that shot actually is um, pretty interesting because you know what? I can bring it up. Um, here you go. Watch this. Wow. So, so one of the themes is that this, this woman, this girl, um, yeah. One, it was review, always was searching for things her entire life, searching for different religions, which is my experience. My dad was Jewish. My mom was Christian. I had, you know, people from the Bible living in the Bible Belt. I had Mooney friends and like yeah. people, you know, Buddhism came around and I was always just kind of searching for a bigger meaning. Um, I lost a lot of people. I went through some trauma. And during those circumstances, you kind of look at life. And um, 
we had an original version of this script where they come down off the the mountain and like she sees she sees like this huge christian mega church and then she sees a family of sikhs that are skateboarding and then she goes to a, into a scientology room like all of these huge ideas so you set up the series that like she's possibly going to explore religion with her family the same way she wrote for bars and instead we couldn't do any of that so this is what we came up with was just that she stops while drinking and looks at this um background which we had made so if you see I don't even know you you notice the coach so it's like alcohol is one you know way to get to the heart of the bottom the Jesus Scientology um yoga blah 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 so love it uh, <laughs> my favorite, without spoiling anything my favorite scene is you on the bicycle with Nelly playing Nelly Missouri native coincidence yeah. or no Darren I am a Saint, I'm a Saint lunatic uh yeah I, if this would ever go further, I would love to get him involved, but that was very, very, very much intentional. So, yeah. And I saw that you're, I know that you have huge music backgrounds. I was going to say that, um, uh, flood, they might be giant album was very important to me. My, my, I had an older, cooler sister who listened to it all the time. And I saw that, I think that you worked with them. So I just wanted to say. Wow, you did your research. Yeah. I was on the management team for whew, five, six years or something like that. And they played a lot in the St. Louis area. I can't remember yeah. if there was a radio broadcast that they released from Missouri, but whatever it is, the Louis, music yeah. is actually great in this, not just Nelly, Led Zeppelin. Is, is that temp music or is that stuff in the clearance process? Um, if, if we sell the show, it's definitely going to get up the budget a little. So right now we're, um, you know, we're have rights to, to do right now, since we're not making any money off of it, it's kind of odd to do a, um, an independently produced pilot, but essentially we're sure. doing it as a proof of concept. And I just really wanted to take this thing under and work with this amazing team and get this made. So, um, if we do sell it and make a version of it, I think the music might change, but um, yeah, we kind of went all out with it. And I, I like the idea that she kind of likes these epic power ballads that are kind of a little like far reaching and not really based in reality. And so there was a big decision to keep, uh, to keep Evie's, you know, kind of out of touch idea of who she is in these, in these like hair bands. So also I just, I'm a big power ballad girl. So I just want to use them as much as I can. Anyone who doesn't like power ballads, you have to immediately be suspicious because it, it really checks every box because it's generally the lightest song that the hard band did. Yeah. And so it's kind of like them dumbing it down and then it makes people who don't listen to heavier stuff maybe rise up to it. So really the middle ground on everything is the power ballad. I don't know what the film equivalent is of the power ballad, but I'd like to find it. Because to me, I think like I have a hard time with sincerity. So although I'm like a diehard romantic, but I kind of cover everything up with like wit and humor. And so I yeah. feel like power ballads are doing the opposite. It's these like raging bands that then get serious. And it's just like the mix is incredible. <laughs> I don't know what the equivalent of a movie would be. You'll have to think about that one. We'll figure it out one day. So yeah. <laughs> I also love the fact that you're the writer, you're the executive producer, you're the star of it. Was the plan from day one to wear all those hats or, or was it a, this person backed out, mm, I guess I'll start in it. Um, it. The plan from day one was actually, I, I kind of experienced this and had been trying to delve into TV. And I had just had like some successes in my feature writing career. Yeah. And I just, I was trying to sell this on a pitch and you can imagine it's a fun um, it's a fun, it's a fun pitch. Cause you're like, you know, I grew up a Christmas tree Jew and my groovy repressed family, my aunt died of cancer and her dying wish was for the whole family to get together, get naked and hike her ashes up a, a new to up a mountain of a nudist Buddhist colony that she secretly joined. And can you imagine doing that with your family? So it starts fun conversations. Yeah. Um, then, uh, I'd been pitching it to a couple different companies and there was interest in it. And then I just decided to go write it myself as opposed to just sign, you know, to try to keep as most much control as possible, essentially, before they give it away to someone else. And then while I did that, the company that I'd been working for, kind of the deals fell apart. And I had already done an Indiegogo with a group of women about this feature film that I'm still hoping to be my first feature that I direct 
Um, but we didn't raise enough money to make the feature. And so it was just the right zeitgeist of all these women that were kind of like, let's just stop waiting for people, gate, like waiting for the gatekeepers. Yeah. We have this money. Let's see. We got it down to a budget um, that we could shoot in five days. And we just went for it. And um, it was the most empowering, incredible experience of my life. And all I want to do is keep making more. Yeah. As and I decided I, to act in it because everyone was just on board and I hope to be able to do so if we go forward, you know, I don't want to stand in my own way, but um, there was just a lot of support. Like mm -hmm. why not? Why? You know, I think there's a, and now, especially with things like girls or so I may destroy you, or just, there's a lot of content creators. Um, and so I think like the mantra now is why not me? So <laughs> I'm just running with that. Well, putting you on the spot here. You just referenced girls and girls, Judd Apatow, was Judd Apatow, you think, the person who kind of told everyone, hey, you can write, star, produce, et cetera? Because sure, you saw Gary Marshall, you know, writer, director, but not really on camera per se. Would you say the tide turned about 15 or so years ago where the star could also be the writer, producer, and people were not laughing them out of the rooms with, with financing it? I mean, I'm sure there's someone else who could reference people more smartly that did it before. Um, girls, I think, did hit really strongly in that um, she was a, you know, not your archetypical female starlet lead, very complex, unapologetic, complicated. Um, so I think not only her doing all of that, but like being the, you know, and the idea, I think also TV is really interesting that complicated women can um, play these lead roles. Whereas movies, it used to be like, there's no way a, a female can, you know, drive the box office sales. And I think that that's definitely changing now too. But historically TV has um, had an open, a more open platform for really complicated women to get in there. And so that's exciting. And I do think Judd Apatow gave her, um, you know, a nice, a nice platform. And so, and I also think with technology and people being able to do their own things, it's just kind of all changing, but I'm for it. But back to you, back to you. You were the <laughs> star of all of this, the, the show that we're talking about, the interview, et cetera. So you have a great reputation for being a person who can adapt a book into a movie or a TV kind of setting. That's not something that everybody could do because let's face it, most people don't have the patience to read anything that's not yeah. on a screen per se. <laughs> I'm curious when this started to feel like a career for you, when everything started coming to you as opposed to you had to hustle and take all the meetings that you didn't want to have to take just to go, yeah, please, if you can and, and wait and wait. Um, you know, some people don't really, my origin story as a writer, I, I think, um, some people don't really like it. I, I started out acting, but I double majored in writing and I did all this crazy political theater. I rode a motorcycle down Viet, Viet, the coast of Vietnam and like joined the circus for a summer and just kind of like had this experimental theater, uh, you know, real kind of renegade spirit. Um, and I feel like part of it was, I didn't feel like I deserved to write yet. Like I was too young to tell my story. So I wrote this version of a, of a movie that I didn't necessarily believe I was ready to, you know, be a full on screenwriter yet. Although like I was just obsessed with movies and stories. And I wrote a version of a, of a, a story of kind of my life growing up, like almost the pre high life story. Mm -hmm. And I gave it to a friend who gave it to a friend. And that friend was Bly Faust who ended up going on to produce Spotlight. Um, she submitted it to the Tribeca Film Festival for new voices in screenwriting. And I ended up um, getting in and winning an award. And that was years ago, but that was like a few years after like the Twilight series came out. And there was this huge groundswell of all of these companies buying these young adult properties right. um, and with complicated female characters. And I never was a fan fiction fantasy person at all. And in fact, um, someone found me, this company found me on Facebook from Tribeca and asked me if I wanted to come in to do a, uh, to do a pitch on there's a book called the mediator series, which was a Meg Cabot book. Meg Cabot did like the princess diaries. And it was like the, the cover of the album, the, the book was like, there's a hot ghost. There's a, there's a hot guy living in Susanna Simon's bedroom. Too bad. He's a ghost. And it was about this girl who like wants to fit in, but kicks, sees ghosts and kicks their ass. And at sure. the time I was like, Oh, 
like YA property. I don't want to do that. I'm so much cooler. So I like went into this room with this attitude of like, it's so obvious that this girl sees through her parents. She's hiding behind her black eyeliner. Like I kind of had this attitude that any actress should have, which is like, you know, I don't need this job. And they hired me and I got into the WGA and made like a really big paycheck. And, um, and from that, I just like really started taking my writing career seriously. I didn't think I realized how lucky I was at the beginning, but um, yeah, I just finished my eighth mini studio book adaptation. This last one is um, Heathen, which is a $60 million comic book movie, lesbian Viking comic book movie that Catherine Hardwick is directing and Joey yes. King is starring in. Um, and I just did another uh, adaptation called Perfect Addiction, which is a boxing romance that's coming out uh, that's supposedly being shot next winter with uh, Kiana Madera, who's the star of Fear Street, Fear Street and Ross Butler and Castile Landon, who's doing some of the after movies is making. So it's been a fun ride. What's not to like about that origin story? Should you have been more desperate? Yeah, I think so. Like sometimes like- Struggled eight more years? Yeah, maybe. Oh. I mean, I definitely still struggled. There was years in that and like, you know, and I've had to really, hone my craft, but I did not go to, you know, get my screenwriting degree, but. Well, think about it. Like Paul McCartney can't read sheet music. So, right. so I don't true. think there's any rule yeah. on what you have. To no, do. I mean, I definitely put in the time. I think to be, I think a lot of people could be writers, but I, um, you know, I can sit in a chair for 13 hours of the day. And then, and then the actress part of me like comes out, like, I think I have kind of a like the character in the high life, I kind of have split personalities and one's a loner workaholic and the other likes to get into some trouble. <laughs> and then, I'm curious about your creative process. Obviously you have a business mind being able to juggle all these products and projects and take all these meetings and actually get the stuff done, not just talk about them. But when you're writing, do you treat it like a nine to five where you go to your office, you write that way, or do you have to feel inspired? Um, I definitely work like I have, like it's my job. And it it is, it, it's interesting when I get hired to write something, it's amazing how many hours you find in a day when there's a paycheck at the end of it. Meaning I'm on contract right now for a couple jobs. So okay. I work harder. And then if I finish them, like that Saturday, will I sit down and think about my new Stephanie Sandage project? I try to, or I always try to do it in between, but um, I'm really regimented. I wake up at seven, I write till 12. I like do some, I've started boxing, I work out, then I eat lunch while I write again till seven again, and then eat dinner. And, and, and it's not all the time, but I, um, yeah, it, that's the light. That's what it takes. <laughs> maybe every, maybe other people are better at it, but that's, um, I, I do treat it at my job. This is my office, my lady cave. So... <laughs> I, I like to, to find that out because I find that people that are successful, and yes, I'm calling you successful right here. Some of them treat it like a nine to five and other people go, oh, no, no. If you don't know what you're doing, don't even sit down to it. And it goes kind of both ways. And are you easily able to work on four projects at the same time or do you have to dedicate to one at a time? It's pretty hard. I actually have some overlap right now in two stu studio jobs and, um, it's easier when one's like in the pitch stage and then another is like total like my project so or TV. So it's really, I don't really enjoy like actually writing two at the same it's time. So if they're kind of spread out, but I'm learning, I'm adapting. Um, I mean, I can't imagine really if I was on set and show running, you know, hopefully the high life gets picked up. And I think to you would definitely have to delegate roles. I can't really imagine writing multiple features while wearing all of those hats on a show. So I think that you have sure. to kind of space it out, but I like being busy. I mean, I wouldn't, none of this is easy. And the hours that I've spent while I am making a career now do not equal the amount of dollars I have made from it. So it's like, obviously I love it, you know? Um, otherwise you wouldn't, otherwise, I don't know. But this is long-term. Well, insurance, like my dad. <laughs> <laughs> but this is long-term where you hope to be writing and acting and producing your content yes that's the that's the dream cool well you're on path for that so the, the last two quick questions and then you're free to okay. get back to work and overwork yourself i have to pack for bentonville 
<laughs> that too. And then speak to more people like me and answer some of these same questions, perhaps in this order. But, this was unique. These were some good ones. So thank you. Well, thank you. The, the first question I have is, besides your show and development, what's something that people should be watching? Do you have a TV or film recommendation you could pass along? Um, I'm in an a Amazon series called 37 Problems, which is pretty funny. Um, a woman named Lisa Ebersole wrote this part for me. It's a it's really e easy to, to, to bite. There's six, there's 12, six minute episodes. Um, I play a crazy character called September who gets into a lot of trouble. Um, so that would be my recommendation for that. Yeah. But you can also tune in and watch the high life this week. It's available all virtually and then hopefully we'll see it soon. And then the, the trailer is on YouTube if anyone wants to watch it. And then the last question I have again, playing into this whole Stephanie is successful <laughs> or at least you can say, this is a person who said, I want to like do this. this. Let's play into that. Yeah, it's cool. I'm with you. That's accurate. That's accurate. My, cool. my stock... Act as if, as they say. Act as if. Well, I'm acting as if. And my closing question, which is a little stock, and you could say as much or as little as you want. It's any last words for the kids. Oh, um, no one actually has asked me. Um, just keep making things keep, if you think that you like something, really do it. Um, if you really, it's really, really hard. It's a really, really hard business and to make a career at it. And so if you think that you want to be an actor, just try it out, talk to people who are doing, it. if you think you want to be a right, just do it, do it, do it, do it. Don't think about it and see, and be honest with yourself. If you really think that you have what it takes, be honest with yourself if you really enjoy it. And it's okay if you don't. Um, otherwise keep doing things that make you uncomfortable, take care of yourself. I think that's a big thing too. You know, um, it's a hard world out there and it can be hard and, um, and surround yourself. Actually, Tina Fey said this in her thing, bossy, bossy pants, um, yeah. surround yourself with people that are better than you or smarter than you, or at least care about you. I really think who your team is and who is around you is really important for your mental and social well-being. And if you're not mentally and emotionally taking care and physically of your body, then it's all, none of it's going to last and be a good person. It's a really tough world out there and it needs a lot of help and no one wants to work with assholes and maybe they will once, but they won't forever. So hi kids. Don't be an asshole. How's that? <laughs> it's the boxing that you regularly do and the boxing related movie that you have coming out. Um, yes, that was really fun during, I, the job was like a dream come true. I'm a really big fan of underdog movies, you know, just the hope. I love sports movies. I love the idea of the underdog working, you know, the, Mer the American dream working, the people who work as hard as possible, get their day at the end and mix that with some like sexy romance. It's fun. Um, I also had the good fortune of during the pandemic, I'd walk around Silver Lake. I live in Los Feliz and you know, everything was closed down. And there was this man named David Gill, who is a coach out of Silver Lake Reservoir. If anyone wants a boxing coach of any age or, or, or ability. Um, and I just like started working with him and he's become like my full on, I don't want to say Mr. Miyagi, but he's become a real, a real friend, um, mentor in and out of the ring. Um, and by ring, I just mean, I punched his hands and no one's ever actually hit my face. So let's not get like too, I'm not, Let's not get too ahead of ourselves. Um, but yeah, so that's just been kind of fun. Yeah. Whatever it is, it makes sense to me. Well, <laughs> thank you for your time. Looking it's forward really to everything fun. that's coming from you in the near future, Stephanie. Thank you for your time. Aaron, bye. Thanks for having Have me. Outro cast.